did that break, and I need this vacation because this team is driving me absolutely insane. Randy Wilkins is going to join us to talk about the Dieter Jock, the captain. Let's talk about a real winner. We're not going to talk about Brandon Bell. We're going to talk about Derek Jeter for a second. But before we do that, Randy Wilkins, Mm -hmm. of course, producer and director of the Jeter Doc, the captain on ESPN right now, 30 for 30. You got a love hate list. A love hate list on what you loved and hated from the home run derby. Now, I'm going to guess what you hated. I'll actually, I will let you do that. Yeah, let me do it. I'm going to give you a statement. I'm going to go what I loved, what I hated, and then you can react to either or or both. All right, let's let's do do it. it. Oh, we going with this beat. Oh. Underdogs on top. Yeah, I had one love by E40, but that's okay. <laughs> you didn't send me anything. Oh well, nobody sent me. System. Nobody My told bad. me anything. My bad, Langford. It's all, all right. bad, Langford. We love the beat. Look, I love that Albert Pujols was in this home run derby, you know? But I hated that I was reminded that Barry Bonds didn't participate in 2007 when it was his final All-Star appearance Mm. here at Oracle Park, a.k.a. AT&T. And that kind of made me sad. I wish we would have had that moment. Yeah, that would have been great to have him at Oracle Park, each Euros on the field. That stunk. Now that I think about it, that did stink. The yard that Bonds built not participating in the home run derby. Again, the Giants, look out for your people, man. That's all. I'm putting that on the Giants. I'm going to put everything on the Giants. All right. Look, I loved the venue yesterday, Bonte, because L.A. Dodger Stadium, beautiful day. I it's know everybody nice. hates on Dodger Stadium. It's one of the oldest in the National no, League you know outside what? of Wrigley Field. It, it po- looks super cool. It popped yesterday. Absolutely. It popped the seats. Look at the scenery. We'll look now. It looks incredible. The mountains, the, the, the beautiful palm sunset. Trees. Yeah. I mean, everything about it, it right? It popped yesterday. It, it's got a nostalgic old school feel yep. to it. But the only thing that I hated, my God. Carl Ravage and Eduardo Perez. That's the best we and I like Carl Ravage in studio. Yeah. That's the best we can do. And he hits it out. Nah, dog. That Me, was a what, squibber back to home. What's my boy from MLB Network, Greg Amsinger? Yeah. Oh, alongside Harold Reynolds or something. I, bring I, them back. I, I, it I, made no you know sense. What? I'm not an A-Rod fan. But damn, go bring A-Rod. Uh, somebody. Where's A-Rod at? Where's Big Poppy? <laughs> okay. Chris Berman? Anybody. Back, 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 back. I love that the entire world found out in real time. Oh my God, J Rod, aka Julio Rodriguez, <laughs> tell him about this. Guy. Is a superstar. Yeah, he's a stud. I'm telling you about this guy. Everybody said, Bonte, why do you always want stars? I just want a young, exciting player. So last time the Giants had a young, exciting player outside of Buster Posey. Thank you. It, it, it feels. And like I'm, it's been I'm not talking about pitchers. I'm talking about hitters. Yes. I just hated. The only thing I hated was that they were squeezing in all these timeouts. Yeah. And, but I, I appreciated I that they kept the screen and screen. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to do the commercials in between, then don't go to real commercial for two full minutes, three full minutes. Like, right. if we're going to do this, go all in the way soccer in. does. No, I'm with you there. I'm with you there. I don't like that either. All right. So, at first, I loved seeing the polar bear, Pete Alonzo, deadlifting <laughs> in between home run derby what, at bad appearances. What about him meditating between pitches? Yeah. That's when I said I'm hating on this fool right now because, dude, you're doing too much. He does that. He was like LeBron James. Dude. We're like, look at me. Right. Look at me. I'm I, meditating. I don't know about you, but when I saw him deadlifting, I thought instantly of Lattimore from the program. <laughs> and I'm like, this guy's deadlifting and hitting squats between swings. All right? Enough, Pete Alonso. It's just a home run derby. Uh, I guess you went back to back. Uh, dude, pipe down a little bit, man. No doubt. But he's perfect for New York City. He's perfect for that town. No doubt. He absolutely is East Coast Jersey Shore. Nope. I love seeing Andres Torres on the field. Did you see him, B? <laughs> I did see him. No, my bad. I hated it because I'm so damn old. I thought Bad Bunny was Andres Torres. Tell me you got confused like I did. <laughs> I didn't know who that guy was with the bandana. I was like, who the hell is that? Because I had to value him down at that point. And then I was like, Man, is that? Who is that? And then it was Bad Bunny. Now I'm thinking to myself. What does Bad Bunny have to do with the home run derby? Uh, what does he have to do with LA? <laughs> I just don't know. I, I associate him I with guess. Miami. I guess it is Miguel Cabrera's walking out with him. I guess he's a Bad Bunny fan. I, I, okay. Yeah. Okay. Again, I hate that I'm that old that I don't even know that. I loved that Juan Soto went up against Julio Rodriguez. It felt like to me yeah. Griffey versus Bonds if we were to have gotten that in the early 90s. Yep. Right? The two marquee players of that particular event that everybody wanted to see. But God, I told you this leading into it. I. I'm so out on Kyle Schwarber. He's the least interesting dude in that entire home run yeah. derby. Hated that he was in there. And also, 
I love the Guardians guy. You know I love Jose Ramirez. Oh, yeah. He had no business being He had no there. business in there. He did. He was out in a hurry. I mean, he was on. forgettable. He had a forgettable performance. All right. <laughs> I love seeing all the young, swaggy players, you know, just dripping and oozing with their chains. But my God, if I have to hear about launch angle and distance, ESPN, I don't care. Hit yeah. dingers. I hate that yeah. analytics is being shoved down my throat at every single moment. Last thing, I love that people are criticizing bullpen pitchers, and I hate that we don't get more skill-type competitions in baseball. I yeah. want to throw into a trash can from dead center. I want to see these guys yeah. put targets relays. all around the field, about, and I want Trey Turner to hit yeah. all these different what, targets. What about relays or going first Something. to third? Fastest from first to third. Quickest fastest, unload from a catcher. Fastest from second to home. But I get you may not want these guys running that hard because you may blow a hamstring or something. Yes. And somebody may get hurt. But I do I do want some of that. I, and I thought yesterday, uh, Jeff Passon tweeted um, about the All-Star game today. How about this? Uh, let me pull this up. Pull it up. Pull it up. Where is it at? Where is it at? Fun twist tonight. If it's still tied after nine innings, there would be a home run derby to determine the winner. I'm feeling the that. AL participants. Ty France, Julio Rodriguez, and Kyle Tucker. For the Na- American League, for the National League, Pete Alonso, Ronald Acuna Jr., Kyle Schwarber. Yeah. I'm not mad at that. No, I'm not either. Last thing, I love seeing the home run chain get dripped and put over yeah. Juan Soto as all the other players were mu- yeah, we mesmerized with how great he was. I just hated that it felt like it dragged on about a half an hour too long. Maybe. I don't know what the solution is, but I can understand those that wanted to turn it off. But right. I thought it was a great home no, run derby. It, it was fun. It was fun. And you know what was fun? Was the program after the home oh run derby. God. We go from home run derby to the documentary of Derek Jeter, the captain at 30 for 30. I'm a sucker for 30 for 30s. You're a sucker for 30 for 30s, Joe Shasky. And we're going to get the guy who produced and directed this documentary Randy Wilkins. I've been following him on Twitter for quite some time, and he's good at what he does. He's a filmmaker. He directed this bad boy, the documentary on Derek Jeter. You look at his avatar on Twitter. He's at Yankee Stadium. How cool is it to do a documentary on Derek Jeter, who was private for the majority of his career, if not all of his career? Randy, good morning. Thanks for waking up with us. I know you're in L.A. You probably went hard last night after watching that documentary. Thank you for waking up with us this morning on the Morning Roast. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Anytime, man. So, first of all, how did this come about? When did the dust set on this Jeter documentary? When did you get involved? Did you pitch it? How did this come about for ESPN? Uh, It started back in June of 2020 uh, when we were still going through the first wave of uh, the pandemic. I live in New York, born and raised in New York, and I got a phone call from Spike Lee. Spike is a major part of my life. I've known him pretty much my entire adult life. Wow. And he, he called me checking up on me, see if I was okay. And then he asked me who my favorite Yankee was. And I said, Derek Jeter. And I was very confused by the question because obviously there were no sports going on at the time. And uh, the Yankees and baseball and Derek Jeter were not really factoring into any of my thinking at the moment. And Spike said that Derek wanted to do a film on himself. Hmm. And um, Spike said that he recommended to Derek that I be that guy to direct it. Wow. And almost dropped the phone. Uh, one, in shock that Derek actually wanted to make a film on himself, and two, uh, because I might have the opportunity to tell that story. So it started there. Uh, funny enough, I just uh, found out last night from my girlfriend that the first phone call or Zoom call I had with Derek and Spike to talk about the project was exactly two years wow. ago to the day yesterday wow. when we premiered it. Wow. So, um, yeah, two years, just like Derek's number. I mean, there's a lot of... A lot of good karma going on, so uh, that's how the project started. That's how we got the ball rolling. Well, you know, I know we, B and I have been talking about this. It, Jeter is the equivalent of what Steph Curry would be here locally, yep. right? Or, you know, pick the player, yep. Joe Montana or whatever. Joe Montana had a, had a documentary that's right. through his lens, and, and Michael Jordan had a documentary that felt like it was through his lens. How do you balance... You know, Jeter having some say on the doc, but yet putting things out there in a way that feels more fair. Because I'm sure that, you know, you everyone who's watching who's not a Yankee fan is like, oh, well, this is just a Derek Jeter propaganda piece. But I watched it, and it felt super raw and real and fair. How do you balance that when you're on the cutting room floor? I mean, the major thing is that you have to make sure that everyone that's a part of the project is allowed to speak their truth and allowed to give their perspective in an honest and authentic way. And I think my job is to 
create an environment where they're comfortable enough to do that. I mean, I told, we did 90 interviews and I told every wow. single person that we spoke to before we got on camera, speak your truth, how you see it, whether it's critical of Derek or not critical of Derek. And I think people took that to heart. I mean, I know a lot of people going into it assume that, you know, this, this is going to be like a Yankeeography. Yeah. Just, right. Just like talk about his Yankee highlights. But I mean, it's, this is a film just like any other film. You know, if we were talking about James Baldwin or Miles Davis or whoever, you know, you're, you're treating Derek as as a character in a film just like anyone else. So they're, they're good things, they're bad things. And we allowed people the opportunity and the platform to say things in the way that they saw it. And as the series progresses, you'll, you'll see people being critical of Derek, being critical of the Yankees. You'll see tension with Derek and a lot of different people. So this wasn't some romanticized ride that people like to uh, think it is or, or follow that narrative. You know, we tried to be as honest and authentic about the entire story as possible. Wow, and we're suckers for it. We wanted to binge watch every episode last night, man. You gave us a little teaser. Yeah. We're talking to Randy Wilkins, filmmaker, director of The Captain for ESPN. Follow him at P-A-M-S-S-O-N. Look, Randy, it's what is so one thing? Good. It's so good. It's so what good. Is, what is one oh, thing, without giving us the future episode or yeah, giving yeah. or spoiling anything, what is one thing you learned about Derek Jeter that you did not know? I think that his identity as a biracial black man really influences the way that he viewed his career, mm. played his career, and how he uh, conducted himself off the field. I think that it has a, a great impact on how he navigates the world. And I, I had a feeling that was the case, but the depths at which that impacts his life, I, I wasn't aware of until you actually speak with him. You know, he mentions... He's, he mentions it in the first episode, but he says it uh, throughout that when he played, he looked at it like a Broadway stage and everybody was watching him and he loved it. That's what he wanted. But as soon as he was off the field, he didn't want those looks because of the looks that he had when he was uh, a young man growing up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, along with his sister and his, and his great parents. So, you know, it's just an interesting dichotomy in which he has to navigate looks in so many different ways and so many different levels that I think... I didn't know how in depth or um, how far reaching that was in, in how he lived his life. Wow. Yeah, th there's so much that I didn't know about him. Didn't know the basketball stuff. Didn't yeah. know, you know, the the way he thought he was going to be either the first or fifth pick overall. Right. The old school computer that they're that typing, so cool. they're typing <laughs> the, the, each selection into. I want to go back a little farther. You said you're a Yankee fan. And, you know, I have a, a vision of who I believe George Steinbrenner to be. And you kind of, like, started to dig a little into George Steinbrenner and his past and him and Dave Winfield and how right. long that team struggled and Don Mattingly. How... I mean, that could be its own 30 for 30 right there, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, squeezing yeah. all that in there. Yep. I'm sure you left stuff out. So what's something about George Steinbrenner that maybe didn't make it into the doc in episode one? Um, I think... We had to cut down the Winfield story just for time, so I think that there's uh, more dynamics to that story than we were than we were allowed not allowed but capable of putting yeah. it just because of being mindful of time. Um, I think, I, you know, there's a lot about George Steinbrenner that that I think we know already, but I think it's also like just his compassion and that you know he had one reputation after he was banned, but I think Michael K. something said something that's very important. The Yankees probably don't get back to prominence if George doesn't come back. Mm. And that, yes, Buck Showalter and Gene Michael built that foundation, but the overall vision and desire to win at all costs comes from George. And I don't think George Steinbrenner's return gets enough credit for that dynasty happening because he still could have traded guys and – you know, he, he gave everybody a, a push in the you-know-what to make sure that they accomplished this goal. Yeah. You know what right. I mean? And, and it, he just has a different personality and presence and a uh, set of expectations that I don't think anybody else in the organization had. Wow. So I think he's a crucial piece, just his presence um, in terms of demand to win that pushed the Yankees over the brink along with Derek's arrival, Mariano's rise, Andy Pettit, Posada, Bernie, all those guys. But George has a lot to do with it. Randy Wilkins here on the Morning Ross on 95.7 The Game, filmmaker, director of The Captain on ESPN, a documentary about Derek Jeter. Um, why is Derek Jeter your favorite player 
all those great Yankee stars. Yeah. You know, all those great stars over there. We mm. know about the stars, and we're from San Francisco. You know, we know about Thurman Munson back in the day. Yep. And, of course, Reggie Jackson. Don and of course, Mattingly. the Mandels, Don Mattingly, Joe DiMaggio, who's from yeah. San Francisco. Why is number two Derek Jeter your favorite Yankee? I mean, you guys mentioned it. He was our Steph Curry, you know, and uh, he was he was the star. He was the, the good-looking guy that he, when he arrived, everything changed. You know, his opening day in Cleveland in 96, when he, he had his first start of that season, he, it just changed. Like, it, it just changed the trajectory of the team. There was everything there, and by – the end of that season, the veterans were looking to him to lead them to a championship. Wow. And he just had that star quality. He's he's our Steph Curry before you guys had Steph. You know, he's Joe Montana. He's Jerry Rice. Mm-hmm. Like, that's how we revere uh, Derek Jeter. I mean, he just – he was that missing ingredient, not just stabilizing the shortstop position because the Yankees kind of cycled through a bunch of shortstops in the early 90s, but he became a leader – and he was extremely confident, and it was just like the, the complexion of the team changed. And then they went on the run, and he's at the center of it. You know, it's, it's really two guys that, as Yankees fans, we always turn to is Derek and Mariano. So because Derek was the everyday guy, you saw him play all the time. So, you know, and he was just a star. He just has it. You know, he's just drawn to him. He has charisma. Um you know, he, he did all the right things, you know, whatever those standards are. You're just drawn to him. So, and as somebody that saw his career starting in high school mm-hmm. until the end, you know, like, that's your guy. So, that's yeah. that's why he's my favorite Yankee. You know, it, it's really interesting perspective because all the guys that you're interviewing in it, talking about Derek, talking about the Yankees at the time, it, it's just incredible. It's like a who's who. You right. know what I mean? It really is. Like, <laughs> me and B were going down the rabbit hole. I got goosebumps yeah. seeing all these old 90s the, guys. We saw, saw Ruben Sierra Ruben popping Sierra his collar. Ruben Sierra was ridiculous. Crazy. <laughs> and then Andy Pettit big leaguing him in the minors. Right. And, 56 and, six errors. I never knew that. It's crazy. <laughs> Buck Showalter yeah. and, and, and him. And then, obviously, Don Mattingly looks super regal. Is there somebody that maybe you didn't get a chance to interview Ooh. that you think could have added to at least the first episode or maybe the 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 overall experience? Because I can't wait for the next six, six episodes. I think it's going to be outstanding. I, I can't believe what you're pulling off here. But is there a guy that or a gal that maybe you, you didn't get a chance to interview because they're no longer with us or they didn't want to work with you that maybe could have provided some more insight? Oh, Stig Michael. Mm. Stig Michael is the architect, you know, and – when you hear from everybody that spoke about him on camera, it, you realize that you're like missing a voice. Mm. You know, he's no longer with us. Uh, so Stick Michael would have been incredible just to get that, that real inside look at what they saw in Derek, how he built that organization back up. You know, he was ahead of his time. He, he was in the analytics before analytics. Um, he believed in on-base percentage. He believed in all those things to build a lineup to make it dangerous one through nine and the qualities you needed to, to create a modern offense. Um, so yeah, I think Michael, you know, he's no longer with us. I wish he was still around and would have been a part of it, but that's one voice that I think would have elevated, uh, especially the first episode. All right. What do we have to look forward to before we let you go? Randy, Randy Wilkins, producer, director at his doc. And I, when I saw you producing it last year, I think you put it out and we've been following each other on Twitter for a while. I was like, man, that's pretty dope. The Dieter Dieter doc 30 for 30. I mean, that's all we do out here uh, is watch 30 for 30s. When is A-Rod going to make an appearance? And what should we look guy. forward to? That's his guy. I love A-Rod. I'm not an A-Rod guy. How do you, first of all, how do Yankee fans yeah. feel about A-Rod? I love A-Rod. And when can we expect an appearance from A-Rod on Jeter? Because I know that's going to be pretty juicy. Well, uh, he makes his first appearance in episode two, which will be this Thursday. Yes. Um, and he's he's throughout. And I don't know. He, you know, he divides the Yankees fans like he divides everybody else. Some people love him, some people hate him. I mean, you know, it's a ride. Like I don't. Yankees fans are no different than anyone else when it comes to Alex. Like some love him, some hate him, some just deal with him. He's just there for some Yankees fans. You know, he's he's across the board like he is with everybody else. Um, but yeah, he makes his first appearance uh, Thursday night in episode two, and then he's he's pretty much in the rest of the series. So I know people thought that we weren't going to talk about it or we were going to duck it. I mean, that's, that's not the case. I mean, he's, he's pretty prominent 
in the film. I love it. You know, you the way you set up his childhood yeah. and his dynamic with his sister mm -hmm. and then his parents and his grandmother and his yep. love for the Yankees and the fact that he was a Yankee fan. He met Dave Winfield. Like, the way you set that up, as you're learning all these things, because I'm sitting there, like, jaw-dropped yeah. watching it. I'm going, this feels like a Disney movie. I mean, it doesn't even feel My real. My girl watched it, Randy. She don't I care about sports. It. She was like, hold on, pause it. I want to watch it. It was unbelievable. Like, that no. had to blow you away as a Yankee fan, right? Right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's you know, it's a dream come true for me as as someone that grew up in the Bronx, was raised in the Bronx. I mean, I went to Yankees games all the time. Like I I I know that franchise. So to hear it from people that were directly involved in helping shape some of my memories is incredible. So um, I feel like I had to do it justice. But I but the important thing though is that we made this film for everyone. This yes. is not just for Yankees fans. Yep. It's for guys in the Bay is for women in the Midwest is for Yank, uh, non Yankees fans, baseball fans, non baseball fans. We didn't, I didn't want to be protective of it and just have it for Yankees fans. That's not fair. Like Derek Jeter transcended the game. So the intention of this was to make it inclusive for everyone and to be, make him accessible to everyone. So I think we did a great job of that. Um, I think we reveal a lot and I'm very proud of it. Do you get into the women? Uh, we get in, we get into a little bit. <laughs> no, uh, gotta keep that <laughs> private. Gotta keep some of that private, man. We heard the stories. The fact that it never got out on social media is a win for Derek there, Jeter. There's a nice fruit basket right. for you at the end of these seven episodes. Uh, we get uh, we talk about gift baskets. We talk about gift baskets. Um, but it's also you know it's important. He's, he's in a different stage of his life. I mean, he's married with three. We, for sure. Girls. Yeah. Sure. You know what I mean? So try to try to be as respectful because he, he made the film for his daughters. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. So uh, so we we talk about gift baskets, but I think, you know, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, he has three girls and he's trying to set an example for his daughters. So um, we touched on it, but, you know, we don't turn it into the New York Post either. <laughs> right, 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 so right. So th no Thursday, the uh, new episode the next come episode. out. Yeah. Come on with us again. Like, I, I know I don't want to yeah. do every episode, but please come on with us again because no I think it's brilliantly done, and I'm not a Yankee fan by any means, and I actually i am probably more of a Jeter hater because he's so yeah. excellent, and I loved yeah. it. I couldn't – I wanted to binge all seven episodes last night. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, I'll definitely come back on, and uh, it's great to be – with you guys specifically, because I'm a huge Niners fan. Blante and I were in a yep. fantasy league a couple years ago. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah Did great. you slap so, him like Jock, I, fan, like Jock and Tommy <laughs> Pham? No, he no he won. Oh, we got there. Well, then I'll slap him. Which for league you. was this, Randy? Because I'm in so many damn leagues. Oh, shut what up. league is this? Oh, uh, shut up. It was the one with uh with Niners Nation. And like some of the uh, oh Tracy uh, and Bourbon, yeah, I did yeah. smoke you guys in that yeah, one. You know exactly. Yeah, 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 I remember that. We were one and done yeah, with that league, here. right? It was like one year and it yeah. was done. Nobody even told me congratulations for winning. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll congratulate you now. <laughs> hey, Randy. Well, we'll congratulate you on this documentary. It's so well awesome, done. Awesome, man. I'm so proud of you, yeah, man. I'm so real. happy for you. You should feel proud to get a call from Spike Lee in an interview. So Derek Jeter, cool. your favorite player. It's got to be special for you and your family. So we'll be watching. We'll talk to you again after the end of the series. Congratulations on this, man. We can't wait for episode two. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Anytime. Randy Wilkins here on the Morning Roast. We got to run. Fascinating stuff there on Derry Jeter, the captain, 30 for 30, 30 for 30. We got confirmation. I think Tory Hunter's coming on. Love it. I owe you $20. Tory Hunter's coming on. Next on the Morning Roast.